presence of biodegradable scaffolds. In a way, the uh, tricalcium phosphates I was discussing are biodegradable scaffolds, but I'm talking more about the, uh, uh, I'm not talking as well, I should say, about other materials such as, for instance, the uh, commonly, seen, commonly known or commonly recognized poly polyl lactates and polyglycolic acid, as well as uh, extracellular matrix scaffolds with type 1 collagen being the uh, tissue that's being worked on most commonly to try and act as a carrier, as an absorbable carrier for, um, for uh, growth uh, promoting materials. Uh, mesenchymal stem cells are another issue that's obviously in our future. Uh, they can be induced towards osteoblastic differentiation, so uh, chances are more than likely that we'll be hearing more about those in the future. So just to summarize quickly, there are uh, many current options. Uh, they are likely to expand dramatically. It's difficult to keep up with our options. As far as uh, genetic engineering, growth factors, and stem cells are, uh, are bound to are bound to become more and more uh, part of our uh, everyday, uh, everyday language. Uh, rationale for current choices remains controversial. I'm sure that everyone has their own method or their own approach. However, the basic principles are quite simple at this point, is to combine osteoinductive and osteoconductive properties in a sufficiently stable and biologically friendly environment to allow timely fusion with minimum possible morbidity. And everyone has their own way of achieving that, but the goals are quite similar. Thank you very much. Great. Next, I'll ask Dr. Daly to give us a presentation on what to do anterior to our graft. Despite the recent frenzy for posterior approaches with the MED and, and, and foraminotomies, the anterior approach, particularly for osteophytes, is still a very well accepted uh, approach. A recent poll of Cervical Spine Research Society members found that 100% of the participants would favor an anterior approach in the setting of a disc herniation with an osteophyte formation. Most of these patients would add a fusion, or most of these people would add a fusion as well. But as the complexity of cases increases, of course, there's going to be some variation in treatment, whether you do a corpectomy, what type of plate you put on, whether you put on a plate at all. There was no significant differences uh, depending on where you practice, but I can tell you, having practiced in Utah, 100 times out of 100, we would take care of this uh, anteriorly. Um, initially, uh, these were done as discectomies, and um, th this is sort of the simplest way to decompress the spine, and often they were not followed up with any fusion. There are a number of papers that have, have now been published in the literature. This is one of the earlier ones, comparing two groups, those patients that had a discectomy versus an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, i.e., those patients who had something put into the space. Many of these papers, and even, even recent ones that have been published, particularly from the Finnish groups, have shown that the patients do equally well. Obviously, those patients who have some bone put in there will fuse at a much higher rate than those patients who have nothing put in. But the problem we all have with this concept is what happens uh, when they kyph into this position. In other words, what are the long-term effects of kyphosis? Do these patients have a lot of pain? Yes. And can they pr proceed to myelopathy? And the answer to that is yes as well. As a result, there have been a number of, of procedures that started really in the 50s with Smith, Robinson, and Cloward to go ahead and put something into this space. You can see here the Smith, Robinson type of graft as well as uh, the Cloward graft. And there have been a number of papers that have been published in the literature uh, reviewing this series. Now, most of these are class three data. In other words, it's sort of a how do I do it type of, of retrospective review. The thing that is, is consistent with most of the single level fusions that you see in, these, in this literature is that there's often a 90, over a 90% fusion rate and over a 90% clinical success rate. Granted, there are a variety of outcome measures used, but, but these patients do pretty well with an anterior cervical decompression and fusion. Well, the problem is when you start to add additional levels on. The, here, the fusion rates aren't quite as high. And in Robinson's series, you can see at the top where the fusion rates significantly drop, down to 50% for a three-level anterior decompression and fusion. A meta-analysis of the literature showed, again, that in multi-level fusion uh, patients with just bone put in alone and no plate, as you see here on the right, um, the, the success rate, i.e., the fusion rate, um, which did correlate with clinical success, was much lower in multi-level patients. So the disadvantages of grafting alone, you can get graft extrusion, you can get graft collapse. Uh, some series report up to a 30% loss of height in up to 10% of patients. Uh, 
there's a need for a rigid external orthosis, which can be encumbering to patients. And oftentimes, these, these series were published, and, and people would use autograft. And then, of course, you have to deal with all the donor complications. Well, there's been more that's published in the literature recently showing that, in fact, uh, using a, an allograft end plate is more efficient than using an autograft and no plate alone. And there's a recent series uh, from the Indianapolis group published by Shapiro that showed these patients that had plating and fusion had shorter hospitalizations and a shorter to return to work. Now, like everything, anterior cervical plating has both advantages and disadvantages. You, we've, we've pretty much already alluded to what the advantages can be, but the disadvantages are, of course, that it adds time, it's potentially more risky, and it adds cost. Also, sometimes it doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. Now, the first generation plates were things like the Caspar plate, and they were great because you could do things like with this spine here on the left that's just horrible looking, and try to reconstruct these patients and, and, and get them up and moving without the need for a halo. The problem is, as, as these needed bicortical fixation, and often uh, would dynamize on their own, the screws would back out and the screws would flat fracture, and then you had hardware complications that you had to deal with. As a result, the second generation plates, things like the CSLP and the Orion came into existence. But the problem here is, oftentimes, these would stress shield the graft, and you get, again, hardware complications or delayed uh, fusions or non-unions because uh, things like happen on the left where the graft stress shielded, and then the plate would fracture. Now, let's look at plating in one-level ACDs. And there was a recent uh, paper from Dr. Delamarter's group that was published by Jeff Wong looking at the efficacy of plating in a single-level ACD. And they took 80 patients and looked at them retrospectively. About half the patients had a, had a plate, and half of them didn't after a single-level ACD. As we've already alluded to, the clinical results showed that patient satisfaction was about the same in both groups. And both groups went on to fuse with pretty high success rates. Um, Problem is, when you get to multi-level procedures, here's where the difference really comes into bear. Uh, again, the same group reported on two-level and subsequently three-level procedures, and they found that in the two-level group, there was a 100% fusion rate with plating, whereas there was only a 75% fusion rate without. And then when you get to three levels, uh, the fusion rate was still pretty high, greater than 80%, compared to in the 60% range when you did not use a plate. In this series, in both of these series, the higher fusion rates correlated with better clinical outcome. The problem is not everybody could achieve those results, and there were a lot of people who did multi-level fusions and found that actually only half the patients were fusing. Uh, that was reported by uh, Ballesta. And then uh, Dr. Bowman's group looked at uh, multi-level ACDs versus corpectomy for lengthy decompressions and found that the multi-level ACDs were really only fusing with a 60 to 70 percent success rate compared to the corpectomies, where you just have the two fusion sites, which were still fusing at over an 80 uh, or 90 percent success rate. So that's where the third generation plates, or the dynamic plates, and there are a variety of these, and the nomenclature is a little confusing, and I'm not going to belabor it, but that's where they've come into being. And the two that I'm the most familiar with are the DOC and the ABC plate, though I've become much more familiar with the Premier plate from Medtronic, and that's very similar to the plate you see on the right, which is the ABC plate. Now, the whole idea behind these plates is that the typical rigid or static plate that you see on the left has to transfer all the load through the plate, and the graft actually sees very little of the load. The theory behind the load sharing plate is that the graft actually sees the load, and thereby invoking Wolf's Law, we should get better fusion <coughs> rates with this. Now, it's always dangerous for a neurosurgeon to start quoting Wolf's Law, but here's, here's sort of the layman's understanding of it, and that's every change in the function of bone is followed by definite changes in its architecture, as well as secondary alterations in its external con conformation. In other words, the bone's going to be as strong as it has to be to bear the load that's imposed upon it. So as you can see here, in a patient who had a, a dynamic plate put in after a two-level ACD, you can see that the graft matures fairly quickly in this case as the plate dynamizes, that is, as the plate settles down okay, around the screws. You can see here when it's initially put in, where it is in relation to the screws, and here it is three months down. In other words, things have settled, the graphs resorb a little bit, and become more dense, hopefully going on to a good fusion. Now, I just wanted to uh, briefly uh, go over a little bit of the data with the dynamic cervical plate, because like a lot of things in medicine, there's often a lot of theory and not a lot of data behind it. And what I'm doing is basically just briefly touching on Ron's data, uh, our data really from the University of Utah, where we have a pretty big experience with these ABC plates, these dynamic plates. Now, we 
looked at um, basically 400 patients that we had up until, this is data from last fall, so it's a little out of date, but it's not too bad, and looked at fusion status, and you can see what, what it is up at the top here. This is about 400 patients with about 650 fuse levels. You can see that the fusion matures over time. So uh, looking at fusion as graft, um, uh, graft integrity, as well as uh, trabeculation, as well as absence of motion at the spinous process tips, fairly rigid criteria for fusion. He had about a 50% fusion rate at three months, and then that went up to 90% in those patients that we could follow at 24 months. And again, in, even in the multi-level fusions, that really tough group, those four-level patients, what you can see is that those you follow up to 24 months, you're getting over an 80% fusion rate with this type of play. Pretty good success. It's not perfect like every, you know, and, and nothing is perfect, but still pretty good success rates. And what I've noticed from these patients is that those patients that are particularly difficult, those that you think wouldn't fuse, are actually maturing nicely over time. Now, you do get some settling with this, and you, we figured we'd had an average of about two millimeters of settling per level. It seemed to occur more with allograft, but most of it occurred early on uh, when we were seeing a lot of the bone maturation. Uh, the thing that I always worried about with these types of plates is whether, in fact, they would fall into kyphosis when you put these plates in. And what we did was we measured uh, the lordosis of these patients uh, from the immediate post-op and tried to follow them over 24 months. What you can see here is what's happened is there is a slight loss of lordosis, but it doesn't quite get back to the preoperative levels. As you can see here on the right, there's a slight loss over time, but it pretty much stabilizes it between 12 and 24 months. So even, in, even with these dynamic plates, you can take a spine that is relatively kyphotic like this, correct it, and hold it in fairly good position so that it won't go back into ky kyphosis like this original x-ray. Now just a brief word about corpectomies to follow up, because this is a very good indication, obviously, for uh, anterior cervical plating. There have been a number of series that have been reported in the literature. Here's a very recent one from Reggie Hayes' group, showing that you get pretty good success rates when you add plating uh, to a corpectomy type of graft. And here he used allograft for everyone and found a fusion rate of 87% by the addition of generally pretty static uh, plates. Uh, I don't believe quite the in patient improvement rate. I would, anybody would love to have a patient improvement rate of 99%, but you do get a pretty good fusion rate when you add plating to these corpectomies. The problem is when you get into the very complex corpectomies. And they're are series that report failure rates as high as 20% with these multi-level corpectomies. Uh, Alex Vaccaro had a 50% failure rate uh, with three-level corpectomies, and then there was a biomechanical study suggesting that corpectomies with an anterior plating alone were much less stable after you do a three-level corpectomy compared to a one-level corpectomy, suggesting that in these long corpectomies, maybe anterior plating alone is not enough and you have to extend the fusion posteriorly. So in summary, what have, we, what have we said? Well, there is some evidence for plating, particularly in multi-level constructs, particularly in corpectomies. The problem is, really, until there's a randomized trial of various different uh, anterior fixation techniques, there's no specific evidence for dynamism, just a lot of theory behind it. So that's what I'm going to leave you with, a new technique that is yet really to be proven. Thanks for your attention.